church at First United Methodist Church for our traditional service. If you're a visitor this morning, we especially welcome you and hope you feel very much at home. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us this day. Dr. Tom Price is going to share some announcements with us as we begin our time of worship. Good morning. It's great to see all of you here on this uh, sunny but chilly morning. A uh, special welcome to uh, anyone that's visiting with us. If you are a visitor, uh, please stop by uh, the Welcome Center. It's located through these double doors behind you. We have a gift for you and more information about everything that's going on here at our church. A uh, special welcome uh, to the Cook family as we celebrate uh, Holy Baptism with them this morning. Uh, take a moment now to sign the red registration pads at the ends of the pews and aisles and pass that down so that everyone might register their attendance this morning. All of the announcements are in the bulletin for you and we invite you to participate in any and all the activities that you find of interest. I have a few to lift up to you this morning. Uh, you'll notice uh, the beautiful flowers on the altar today are given to the glory of God and in memory of Chip Burns uh, from his funeral yesterday. Uh, please keep uh, uh, his family in your prayers. Uh, remember, January is coffee and cooking month, so we encourage you to stay after the service. And down this hallway right here, uh, we have coffee and cookies for you. Our financial peace uh, preview sessions uh, start uh, next Sunday, uh, no, Sunday, January 26th at 945, at 1155, and at 2 p.m. in Paxton Hall. It's a 15-minute video about the program and a chance to uh, uh, answer questions. The regular classes will start February 9th. Uh, Worship Under the Stars is coming up. It'll be held uh, Friday night, February the 7th at Whiskachetta Retreat Center. Uh, the, we'll be leaving the church here at 6 p.m. and return approximately at 9.30. It's a light dinner worship uh, with music led by our own Emmy and Paul. Uh, so it's gonna be a great uh, time under the, under the uh, beautiful skies. Uh, so come out and join us for that fellowship. And now Melinda Losey is uh, with us this morning to speak to us about our opportunities for service. Melinda. Good morning. Well, today is our Opportunities for Service Commitment Sunday. Last week we handed out our booklets, and um, at this time if you didn't get one, would you raise your hand and our ushers will bring you one at this time. Um, on the back page is the commitment card, and that is the, what we will be bringing forward at the end of our service today when we do our baptismal renewal. I'd ask that you please make sure you mark down any areas of ministry that you would like to continue in and also any new areas that you would like to take part in. Um, we also ask you to fill out the contact information part because we update our records through this process every year. And over the next month, you will receive um, confirmation from our ministry chairs or staff that are in charge of the ministries, and they will get you going and get you started in the ministries you've chosen. I've said it before, I told you last week, we cannot do ministry without you. Um, as a body of Christ, we all work together in the ways we've chosen to make a difference in the world, to give hope, to help provide basic human needs such as food, clothing, and shelter, to show love and compassion to our neighbors locally and globally, and for um, volunteering with our, our own church, local church family here, to enable them to grow spiritually in worship and study and to reach out to the community, to care and maintain our church campus, to reach out to our shut-ins and to our care center residents, and so much more. I, uh, myself, the clergy, the ministry chairs, thank you in advance for your commitment to serve. Thank you, Melinda. Again, we want to welcome you here on this Sunday morning. Let's prepare now to worship our Lord.
Please stand and join with me in our invitation found in your order of worship. There are many gifts, but one spirit. We offer our gifts in the service of the living Christ. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you sent Jesus to proclaim your kingdom and to teach with authority. Anoint us with your spirit that we too may bring good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. responsive reading this morning comes from Psalm chapter 40 verses 1 through 8. It can be found on your hymnals on page 774.
waited patiently for the Lord, who inclined to me and heard my cry. The Lord drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. The Lord put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and be in awe and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. O oh, my Lord, my God, you have multiplied your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than could be numbered. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Lo, I come. In the roll of the book it is written of me. I will delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. share signs of peace with one another. parents and any others who are standing with her to come at this time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church, incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price ask of you now, the parents, do you this day turn away from your sins and confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, you will answer, we do. the church by your teaching and example to guide her and to accept God's grace for herself to follow Christ openly and to lead a Christian life if so say we do let us pray dear Lord in the fullness of time you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb he was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit he called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection to make disciples of all nations and now, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and this precious child who is baptized today, to cleanse her and surround her with your love all of her life, that in dying and being raised with Christ, we may share in his final victory. Amen. That's Adeline Claire. Okay, Adeline Claire, I baptize you this day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may God always bless and keep you. Amen. Amen. And I present to your love and care this day, Adeline, whom we recognize to be a member of the family of God. And let the choir see.
and the congregation has a part to play in all of this. We promise to pray for this child and to do our part in helping to lead this precious child to Christ. And so we all respond together with the congregational response. With, with God's, God's help, help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ, that Adeline, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Amen. 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 Thank you all, and God bless you. At this time, we invite the children in the sanctuary to come on down to the front. Children, why don't you, and you want them on either side of the table? Okay, so sit on either side of the table up here, and Miss Corville has a message for you. Come on to the front. Well, I am so glad to see all of my friends. <laughs> I have a friend here, but he's really a troublemaker, but <laughs> he's always trying to get my candy from me. That's what it is. Well, you know, boys and girls, oh, some more friends. And you can just sit right on the floor if you want. That's awesome. I'm so glad that all of you are here. Oh, my goodness. Lots of friends. Well, you want to just sit down right there? Look, he, you can sit right by him. There, he has a place. Well, how many of you have a computer at your house? I bet a lot of you have a computer, and if you don't have one at your house, you have one at your school. And do you know that those computers, they just store lots of information. They're so smart. Sometimes we get one of these, and we push it in, and we're like, whoa, listen to them singing, and it's just one song after another. <laughs> and you know... That's, you, you have a computer. It's built right into you. Would anybody know what that is? It's your brain. Do you know that you have a built-in computer to store up information? And do you sometimes forget what kind of information needs to go up there? We need to study God's word, and we need to learn what our Bibles say and memorize those verses and put them up here in our head because, you know, God tells us to do that. He said, store up his word so we can fight evil things that come against us. And when bad things happen, then you can say, Mm, this is what God said to do, and we'll know how to handle it. So I want you to remember your computer, and I want you to study your Bible, and I want you to remember to come to Sunday school, and we're getting ready to have a contest, and we're going to learn more about that coming up. And so we need all of you at Sunday school, and we'll be memorizing some good Bible verses. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, let us stand on it and store it up for when we need it. Amen.
us pray. Holy and gracious God, we are thankful to be in your house this day. We are grateful that we can lift your name up, for you are holy and good. Thank you for letting us open our eyes this morning to experience this beautiful day that you have given for us. Lord, sometimes we come into this place with worries on our heart. Sometimes we bring anxiety. Sometimes we bring doubt or anger or fear. Sometimes we bring our struggles with us of those demons that we cannot ditch, dear Lord. They come to us and they come with us. Lord, help us to lay those burdens down. You say, come unto me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. We seek your rest this day. We seek your promise. Lord, you are a healer, and you tell us that there is nothing too big for you to be able to handle. So this day, help us to put our faith and our trust in you, that you can stand along beside us no matter what we're facing, that you can help us through. No matter the grief or loss, no matter the struggle, no matter if we feel that we've failed a thousand times before, your mercy is still here for us. Lord, forgive us for forgetting your goodness and your mercy. Forgive us for not remembering that we are your people, for doing what we know is wrong. Lord, help us set our feet onto the right path. As we go from this place, help us go as changed people, as people claimed by you on a mission to bring your love, your mercy, and your grace to everyone that we meet, to choose to do good this day and forevermore. That's our prayer this day, dear Lord, and we give you thanks. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught all of his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is My Lord, What a Morning, number 719. Let us stand for this hymn, and then we'll be seated for the scripture.
You may be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel which I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you, and this is of the most important that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have passed on. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Questions are so important. It's good and healthy to ask questions, especially of our faith. And that's why in these several weeks, we are preaching on challenging questions in a skeptical age. A couple of weeks ago, it was, how can I believe in a God that I can't prove? Last Sunday, why is there suffering and evil? And now this morning, did the resurrection of Jesus really happen? The bottom line question is this. Does Christianity have a solid historical basis? Is there sufficient evidence for the resurrection of Christ that's convincing and compelling? I want to say at the very beginning that this question is of the greatest importance. If somebody today could actually disprove the resurrection of Jesus, then Christianity would be destroyed. If the body of Jesus were ever found, somebody would uncover his bones, say, here is Jesus, that would be the end of Christianity. Our faith today stands or falls with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If that is not true, then Christianity is not true. Here's what the Apostle Paul said in our scripture reading for today from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain. So our question today is of the greatest importance. Did the resurrection of Jesus really happen? Now just to be clear, I'm not talking about a spiritual resurrection. That the spirit of Jesus stayed alive in the hearts of his followers and those who loved him. I'm talking about the actual, literal, physical resurrection of Jesus. Now, he talked about his own resurrection over and over again before it happened. All through the Gospels, he talked about his death that was coming, and he always said, and three days later, I will rise again. For example, Mark chapter 8, verse 31 the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days, rise again. So here's the question to ask. What is the evidence? What's the evidence? I'm quoting now from a good book that I read recently entitled Reliable Truth by Richard M. Simmons III. Here's what Dr. Simmons said in his book. We know more about Jesus' burial than any other person in all of ancient history, more than any Old Testament character, more than any king of Babylon, more than any philosopher of Greece, and more than any triumphant Caesar. We know who took him down from the cross and who bore him to his tomb, and we know where the tomb was and who owned it. So here are the facts of history that nobody can dispute. Jesus was crucified, he was buried, and three days later, his tomb was empty, and his followers believed that he rose from the grave. And that was the beginning of the Christian church. I'll say it again, our faith today stands or it falls on the truth of the resurrection of Christ. Now, to me personally, as I think about this subject and pray about it, there are three main historical facts that point to its truth. Here they are. The empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning, the appearances of Jesus after his death, 
and the transformation of his disciples. So an answer has to be given for those three things. Why did they happen? What's the explanation? Now, a sheet of paper is in your bulletin, a little blue sheet that looks like this, if you care to jot these down and keep track of them. Here's the first question. Why was the tomb of Jesus empty three days after his death? What happened to the body of Jesus? Or did he really rise from the dead, as he predicted? Why was the tomb empty? I want us to consider this morning some possible theories about the empty tomb that have been suggested and argued over the years. First of all, some people have claimed over the years that it was all a, a big fraud. According to them, the tomb was not empty, but here's what happened. Early on that Sunday morning, the women went to the wrong tomb. We'll talk about that in a second. Sometimes people claim that the body of Jesus was stolen. So I want us to think about this fraud theory for just a minute to see if it's possible. Is it possible that the women went to the wrong tomb on that first Easter Sunday morning? Now, personally, I kind of laugh at that. If by some strange chance, even though they saw where he was buried, even though they were present at the burial, I guess it's possible that they went to the wrong tomb. But I have a lot of trouble believing that the women went to the wrong tomb and then they ran to the disciples and told them and the disciples ran to the wrong tomb. That I have trouble believing. And then the Jewish authorities heard about this and they went to the wrong tomb. That really stretches credibility to think that everybody ran to the wrong tomb. The preaching of Jesus rising from the grave took place in what city? You know it. Don't be shy. It took place in Jerusalem, right down the road from where Jesus was buried. That's where they were proclaiming, Jesus is alive. If the enemies of Jesus wanted to kill Christianity, all they had to do was produce the body of Jesus. If Jesus were still in that tomb, why didn't they go to that tomb and get the body and put it on an ox cart and parade it through downtown Jerusalem? They would have killed Christianity in the womb before it ever got started. Here's the reason they didn't do that. Because the body was not in the tomb. The tomb was empty three days later. So we have to ask the question, why is that? Why was the grave of Jesus empty three days after the crucifixion? I've heard people say, well, the disciples stole the body. I want to remind you that the Jewish authorities and the Romans did everything possible to keep that from happening. In fact, his grave was guarded by Roman soldiers and perhaps a Jewish guard from the temple. A large stone was blocking the entrance to the tomb that weighed one to two tons. So here's what those disciples would have to have done to steal the body. They would have to overcome the guards, move that one-ton stone, break the Roman seal on the tomb, which was punishable by death, do all of that without anyone seeing or hearing anything in the middle of the night, and don't forget that his disciples at this particular point were scared to death. They were off hiding behind locked doors. But here's the kicker that makes me say, <clears throat> no way. Of those 11 disciples, because remember Judas had committed suicide, of those 11 disciples, 10 of them died for their faith. I'm quoting now from Alex McFarlane, who wrote a book on this. He said, the Christian martyrs of the first century did not die for an idea or a promise. They died because they were eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. If Jesus' body was stolen, which we've already shown is not only unlikely but impossible, then his disciples would have all eventually died for something they knew was not true. With the exception of John, his disciples each endured horrific deaths. They were separately crucified, boiled in a vat, and subject to other tortures and horrific ends. He finishes by saying, no sane person would willingly endure such torment 
to publicly validate a lie that he had created. So I asked the question, were those disciples crazy? Were they deluded? Look at those guys. They wrote, they traveled, they preached all over the known world, they spoke to large groups and to small groups. There's no hint of them being deluded. To me, there's no question about it. Those men and women were absolutely sane, but they were changed. In a matter of days, they went from being cowards to being bold preachers of the gospel. Now, how can that be explained if they stole the body? You know, not a single disciple ever changed his story. Not one. Every one of those guys was willing to die for the truth that Jesus had come back to life. Simon Greenleaf was the founder of Harvard Law School. He's one of the greatest legal minds in American history. He spent a lot of time investigating the claims of the resurrection of Jesus. Here's what he said after his long investigation was over, and I'm quoting from him now. <clears throat> he said, It was therefore impossible that his disciples could have persisted in affirming the truths they have narrated had not Jesus actually risen from the dead. Had they not known this fact as certainly as they knew any other fact, he concluded by saying, and this is an amazing statement from the guy who founded Harvard Law School, the resurrection of Christ is the most verifiable fact of ancient history. So that's the first question that has to be answered. Three days after his crucifixion, the tomb of Jesus was empty. How do you explain that? Second very important fact that has to be accounted for is the large number of people who claim to see Jesus alive once again after the crucifixion. After his death, he appeared to Mary, Mary Magdalene. He appeared to other women. He appeared to Simon Peter and to John. He appeared to his disciples without Thomas present. And then he appeared to them with Thomas present. He appeared to seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee and he cooked breakfast for them. In our scripture reading for today, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Katie read, that's probably the oldest part of the New Testament, which she wrote. Paul said in A.D. 56, Jesus appeared to at least 500 other people, most of whom were still alive at the time of that writing. So today, <clears throat> let's take those 500 eyewitnesses who saw Jesus alive after his death and burial, and let's put all 500 of them in a courtroom. If each one of those 500 people were to testify for only six minutes, including cross-examination, that would be an amazing 50 hours of first-hand testimony. 50 hours of first-hand testimony. That would have to be the largest and the most lopsided trial in all of history. So how can that be explained away? How can we just shrug our shoulders at it and say, I don't know. Now, for some people over the years, it's quite a stretch. Here's the explanation. According to them, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He swooned on the cross. You ever heard that theory? He didn't die on the cross. He swooned on the cross. He was on the cross, and he lost blood pressure, and he was exhausted, and everybody thought he was dead, but he really wasn't. I want us to, to see how crazy that is. <clears throat> they want us to believe this. Jesus went through seven trials. He was beaten by the guards, was given 39 lashes that tore his back, just lacerated his back. He was so weak that he couldn't even carry his cross to the place of crucifixion. And then he was crucified, the most brutal means of execution ever devised. Nobody ever survived a crucifixion. He was on the cross for six hours. Then he was certified as being dead by the Roman guard. But just to be certain of that, a spear was thrust into his side and blood and water poured out, a certain sign of death. After that, he was wrapped in a hundred pounds of spices, put inside a tomb with a large stone rolled across the entrance, guarded by soldiers. But according to this theory, he didn't die. 
he survived all that. And then he freed himself from all that spice wrappings, and then he rolled away the stone. He got by the guards. Then he appeared to his disciples as the Lord of life and the conqueror of death. I don't know for you, but that to me is beyond credibility. A German theologian, David Frederick Strauss, was not a Christian, but I want us to hear what he wrote as he looked at this story. He said, It is impossible that a man who had sneaked half dead out of the grave, who crept about weak and ill, needing medical attention, who needed bandaging, strengthening, and indulgence, could have given to his disciples the impression that he was a conqueror over death and the prince of life, an impression which lay at the bottom of their future ministry. And something else. I've heard people try to explain the 500 eyewitnesses by saying, well, it was all hallucination. The followers of Jesus wanted to believe in Jesus so badly that they hallucinated that he was alive again. Well, let me say pretty clearly, Jesus didn't just appear to those who believed in him. He also appeared to unbelievers, like his brother James, and to Saul of Tarsus. He appeared to unbelievers as well as believers. And also, there's no such thing as mass hallucination. That doesn't happen. I can hallucinate something, and you can hallucinate something, but we don't hallucinate the same thing at the same time. And for sure, all of us here today will not hallucinate the same thing at the same time. So the question has to be answered. How do you explain the appearances of Jesus to over 500 people after he was dead? In the book of Acts chapter 2, Simon Peter is preaching after the crucifixion to hundreds of people in Jerusalem. Here's what he said. God has raised this very Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this fact. <clears throat> A third very important fact that has to be accounted for is the transformation of the disciples. How in the world did that happen? These guys went from being terrified cowards in the Garden of Gethsemane to bold preachers of the gospel three days later. How do you account for that? We have to ask that question. What changed those guys? What transformed them from hiding behind locked doors to boldly preaching the gospel in front of hundreds of people out in the public? To me, there's only one answer. They had seen Jesus alive once again, and it changed their lives, and it transformed them. Christ was alive again. Our question for today is this. Did the resurrection of Jesus really Happen? Is there evidence for it? Three things have to be accounted for. And for me personally, those three things say, yes, it did happen. The empty tomb, the appearance of Jesus to over 500 eyewitnesses, and the transformation of his disciples. He rose from the grave, and that changes everything. A famous missionary told about going to South America. And he discovered there a tribe in the jungle that lived right next to a river. People in that tribe were very sick. They had a disease, and dozens of them were dying every day. Just a few miles away across the river was a hospital that offered a cure to this disease that they were suffering from. And he told them about the hospital and how they could all get help, but they were afraid to cross the river. They believed that river had demons and devils in it, and to go into the river meant certain death and they wouldn't do it. So the missionary called them all to come down to the banks of the river, and he touched the water, and he said, look, but it's not going to hurt you. There are no devils in here. He splashed the water. He said, look, the water's not going to hurt you. There are no devils in here. I came here by coming across the water. It's not going to hurt us. They still wouldn't believe it. He thought about it, and here's what he did. He turned around, and he dove head first into the water. And he swam under the surface all the way to the other side of the river. And he came up on the other side, and he punched his fist in the air, and all of the Indians started cheering and cheering and clapping. You know, that's what Jesus did for us. He plunged into the waters of death, 
and he came out on the other side alive forevermore, and he showed us the way to find life. He is who he claimed to be, and that changes everything. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for giving us good minds that can think and question and struggle with our faith. Thank you, Lord, for giving us good answers. Thank you, Lord, for pointing us to the Scripture. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. I pray that it will make a difference to all of us here this day. In Christ's holy name, amen. And now we affirm our faith together through the words of the Apostles' Creed found in your order of worship. Let us stand as we do so. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you for hope and faith and a gospel to share. Bless this offering to that end. In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated.
closing hymn this morning is number 371, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. And as we sing this hymn, we have a special moment in the life of our church, a time that we are given to renew our baptismal covenant, our <coughs> baptismal vows. As you know, in the United Methodist Church, we baptize like we did this beautiful baby this morning by sprinkling. We also baptize by pouring or immersion, but we only baptize one time. We don't re baptize someone. We only baptize one time. But there are moments in the church that we can reaffirm our baptism. And that's what we're doing this morning since the new year just started a couple of weeks ago. For those of you who would like to do so, as we sing our closing hymn, I invite you to come to the front. We have two bowls of water here. We can have two lines here and two lines here. I invite you to touch the water and maybe touch your head and remember your baptism. Say, Lord, thank you for my baptism. You probably don't even remember your baptism. I don't. I was baptized as a little baby, but I thank God for my baptism today. And then we invite you to get a shell and to keep that with you to remind you of doing this today. There's also a basket up front for those of you who have completed the opportunities for service cards to turn that in. To me, both of them go together. We renew our baptism, and we're saying, Lord, I want to work and volunteer in the church. If the Lord is leading you this day to join First United Methodist Church, I invite you to come forward at this time. So we're handling a lot at this time. You got it all? We're singing the closing hymn. We're renewing our baptism. You're getting a shell, and we're turning in our card. And if you want to join, you do that at the same time. Let's have a word of prayer as we do this. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to renew our baptism. May this be a special moment for all of us. In Christ's name. Amen. And again, two lines here and two lines here. Come as the Lord leads you.
78. 